Uh, brothers and sisters, please pray with me as we turn to the scriptures. Um, Father, will you please work in our hearts so that we might hear your voice. And Father, hearing it, we might be challenged, encouraged. We might find life and we might learn to keep turning from our sins and to you. Father, please work in us for your sake this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, our passage this morning, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 7, 1, starts with a very stark command. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, you know what a yoke is, right? It's that jolly great lump of wood that you stick across the necks of oxen, and then it gets bolted or tied in place in order that their lives are strapped together and strapped to the plough that comes behind them. Wherever one goes, the other goes. Uh, it's the thing that actually ties you to a way of life and to a direction and to everything that sets the course of your existence. And the question that Paul wants to ask today is, are there any ways in which you have tied your life to the life of unbelief or unfaith? Have you connected yourselves with unbelievers or with unbelief with practices and things that are just out of step with what it means to walk as a follower of Jesus? Are there elements of the life or belief of your unbelieving friends or family or people in your community that you've bound your life to and so are in danger of becoming unbound from God? You see, if you remember, we're in the middle of a long section in Paul's letter to the Corinthians where he's defending his ministry. Um, the super apostles lie in the background, although we haven't seen them yet. But Paul's in the middle of an argument. There's been a number of incidents between he and the Corinthians, and it's not clear whether the Corinthians trust him or not. And yet if they fail to trust him and his message that he's bringing from God, they're in danger of letting go of the gospel. And Paul's been pleading to them to listen to him and be in relationship with him and so be in relationship with God. Uh, the end of the last passage, verse 11, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Paul cries out to them and he says, be in relationship with me. Don't, don't let me go. I have the truth from God. But at this point, the argument pivots and he starts to turn and attack that problem from the other direction. He says, open wide your hearts to me. And on the flip side, do not be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Don't tie yourself to a life of false teaching or to a life of unfaith. And really our passage today is a deep uh, and argued plea to understand why tying your life to unbelief would be such a crazy thing to do and why you must actually flee from anything that has even the hint of unbelief associated with it. The argument comes in three parts. He basically says belief and unbelief are as far apart as it's possible to be. He says if you understand your relationship with God, then you will understand why you need to separate yourself. And then finally, he makes the call to complete our holiness. So firstly, he starts off by describing how far apart belief and unbelief are, verses 14 to 16. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? There's this string of rhetorical questions and each question is actually supposed to have the answer, none. There is absolutely none. So I want to try a little experiment to you. This is not really going to work online. It would be much better if we were together. But as I get to the end of each question, I want you to say loudly at the screen, none with me, right? I just want you to think about what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? None. What fellowship has light with darkness? None. What accord has Christ with Belial? None. What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? None. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? None. Now you get the point right, but Paul is really inviting you to sit and to dwell with the reality of the stark distinction between these two sets of things. Uh, and the light and darkness one, I think, is a really powerful and helpful image. Um, you've ever had that experience of arriving home late at night, it's pitch black, 
you're kind of fumbling around in your pocket for the keys. You pat down the door to try and find the spot where the key goes and you try and direct the key into that thing and you kind of stumble through the front door and then you're feeling around on the wall for the light switch. Have you noticed that moment when you flick the light on and all of a sudden the darkness disappears? There is, it, it's actually miraculous when you think about it. Pitch blackness, you cannot see anything. And then there's a moment and the light comes and there is no darkness. And then as soon as you turn the light off, the darkness returns again, but they're so antithetical to each other that they cannot exist in the same place. If the darkness is there, there is no light. And if the light comes, there is no darkness. And that picture actually describes the antithesis of all of these things. See, what does Christ have to do with Belial? Uh, another name we think in scripture for Satan. Um, the prince of righteousness and the head of darkness. These things are as far apart as they can possibly be. What does God have to do with idols and idolatry? The lump of wood that's lifeless and unable to change anything and that you can fall down and pray to that will make no difference versus the living God who created the heavens and the earth. And again, the picture is, if you like, standing in the middle of a room with the idol in one corner and God in the other. If you turn towards one, you automatically turn your back to the other. So if you turn in belief towards God, you turn away from unbelief. But if you turn towards unbelief, you actually turn away from God. Every one of these images is designed to show you the stark reality of the choice that lies in front of us as people who want to follow God. And right in the middle of that, we read this little sentence, what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Now, actually, that's a really challenging question for us, I think, um, because there are there are so many things that make us the same as the unbeliever, right? We're human. We think and we laugh and we feel and we cry and we live and we rejoice and we die. So much that we share in common and actually so much of the television that we consume, so many of the movies that we consume are all about the common reality of our humanity that just makes us all the same. Uh, and the common longing is there's not really that much of a distinction between you and me and don't worry too much about what you believe in. But Paul wants to say here that actually at the point of belief in the living God, or in the point of living and believing in the gods of this age and this world, whether it be the, the God of power or the God of money, the God of sex and lust, the God of whatever else it is, nothing could be further from each other and there is this massive distinction between the two. And so as Paul says, don't be yoked with unbelievers. Don't allow your life to be connected together with people who are walking away from God. Now at this point, he changes the and moves to the point of the argument because he goes on at this point to ask the question, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And he's gonna to move to this picture of the temple for a moment to talk about the presence and the dwelling of God with his people. Because not only do these two categories of things, belief and unbelief, light and darkness, exist entirely apart from each other, but Paul wants to, you to know where you are because of the gracious work of God. Pick it up with me in verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Um, there's so many riches in these verses. It's a concatenation of Old Testament quotes from all sorts of parts of the Old Testament. Um, but all I really want you to do at the moment is just to stop and look at the logic with me for a minute, because there are two moves that he makes. See, first he says, God's presence precedes holiness. That is, God chooses to dwell with us, which leads us towards holiness. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I think perhaps this is the most fundamental and persistent of God's promises in the whole of the scriptures. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And I will walk among them, says God. And it's interesting, isn't it? Even that image actually takes you all the way back to the garden. 
as God walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Here is the, the goal of humanity's existence is to walk in deep and rich fellowship with the living God who made us, and yet sin destroys it all. But in the face of sin, God's persistent promise to Israel, which becomes God's promise to us in Christ, is I will be your God and you will be my people in spite of your sin. I will cleanse you, I'll make you great, and I'll actually treat you as my treasured and precious possession. And Paul wants to say, what actually could you have in all of the universe that is worth more than this? What could you possibly possess that would be of greater value to you than relationship with the living God who controls heaven and hell, who made the creation and who will reform the new creation? And this God speaks tenderly with us and he says, I will dwell with you. But do you see the logical conclusion of that? If there's light and darkness, if there's Christ and Belial, if there's God and idols, and this God dwells with you, what must you do to your relationship to idolatry and to the unbelief around you? Well, therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. If God chooses to dwell with you, then everything else goes, the lies, the deceit, sexual immorality, petty jealousy, self-interest, unrighteous anger, haughtiness of spirit, all the dreams and longings of the unbelieving world actually become as rubbish to us. They are things to be separate from and not even, not even to touch them, not even to have the hint of the possibility of being stained by them. Um, now, my household has had a really deep experience of this uh, uh, in the last month or so. Um, my daughter uh, was actually in contact um, with someone who was diagnosed positive for COVID-19. She'd been, she'd seen them a couple of days before the diagnosis came through, the phone call came in, and all of a sudden she was banished for the next 12 days to bring the end of 14 days since she'd last been in contact with that person. And for 12 days, she basically stayed in her room. She had one bathroom in the house that was set apart for her. None of the rest of us touched that spot. The only moments in almost two weeks that she, when we saw her, she was covered up in a face mask moving from one room to the other. To take her dinner to her, we would put her plate on the middle of a tray and we would carry the tray. She would take the plate off the tray. She would return the plate to the tray. We would come back with the plate outside the door, carry the tray to the sink in gloves, wash the whole thing up. Here was this thing that was actually in danger and, and she felt she did so amazingly well of possibly endangering the rest of her family as well as her. Here was this uncleanness that represented such a threat that you would do everything not to come in any contact with it whatsoever. How much more, if you belong to the living God, do you flee from sin? Do you, not even getting as close to it or drawing the line or working out where the gap is, but you don't want to be stained with it. You don't want to have the possibility of the hint of this corruption, of this evil, of this thing of death and decay coming into your life. God says, I will dwell with you and I will be your God and you will be my people. So come out from them. Don't play with unbelief. But do you notice the absolutely beautiful thing about God's promise here? It's not just that God's presence precedes this separation. But separation in God's kindness, he grants us the promise that as we separate, we're actually separating and walking back into the arms of our loving God. Because do you notice what happens next? Be separate from them and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Just as the Lord's presence leads us to be separate, God in his kindness says to us, as you separate yourself, remember to whom you come. As you say no to sin and keep turning to me, I stand here as your father, the most intimate of all of the terms of all of scripture. The God of the universe welcomes you as your father, as you turn away from the stain of sin. And brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you um, as you struggle and are faced with temptation to keep remembering this truth. 
because there is so much temptation, isn't there? As you watch the Netflix binge and you desperately want the hero, finding you find yourself in your heart wanting the hero to sleep with the heroine because they've kind of gotten on with each other and it's just the way things happen. Or I look at that lifestyle and I think my life would be so much better if I just got to live like they live. Or maybe for you, it's the possibility of escape from the monotony of lockdown that happens when you're alone in front of the screen late at night. Or maybe there's a desire to lie or to ignore what God has said is right. Maybe you find yourself condoning your jealousy or trying to justify your anger because you have a short temper because everybody's locked inside and has a short temper. But at every point, Paul wants to say, come out, separate, touch no unclean thing, have nothing to do with the life of unbelief. But remember that you don't just do that as a matter of fear. You do that because you belong to God. And as you say no to that, you are actually saying yes to your father who delights in the decision to turn to him and away from sin. And you notice that's where Paul brings it home. Verse one, chapter seven. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Our privilege as sons and daughters of the God who saved us in Jesus is to actually let go of defilement of spirit and body and to bring holiness to completion by the gracious work of his spirit within us. And so friends, really today, I guess I want to stop and just plead with you and ask the question, are there points in your life where you have made a comfortable truth with unbelief? Are there elements of things that are happening to you in lockdown? Are there places that you're going emotionally? Are there things that you're doing? Or are maybe they're just elements of unbelief, elements of worldview that you know conflict with the Bible, but you're afraid to let go of them. God stands in front of you saying, when I speak the truth to you, it is for your blessing and good as your precious father who is calling on you to come to me. And so Paul wants to say, cleanse yourself from every defilement of body and spirit. If there is something going on in your life at the moment, if there's an aspect of unbelief, an aspect of yoking your life to a way of life that is walking away from God, I actually want to appeal to you and plead to you to stop and to do something about that. Make the day today the day that you speak to someone, speak to a chaplain, speak to your minister whom you trust, speak to a dear friend who you know will challenge you and help you. But don't persist in being content to try and let belief and unbelief sit side by side. They cannot coexist. Remember, your father loves you and he's calling you to what is good for you. So don't be unequally yoked. Let go of sin, flee from unrighteousness and bring holiness to completion. We're going to spend some time praying now uh, and I'm going to hand over to Lana who's going to lead us in prayer.